All right, it's seven. So I was kind of waiting. Yes, there's number 40. 40 is a good number of participants, uh, attendees to get started. Um, yeah, thanks for dialing in to our webinar on ArangoDB 3.7. We released it about two weeks ago, so it's really time that we have this webinar as well. And to be honest, it actually took us a long time to release given all the uh, COVID measurements, given all the uh, changes, but I, this is actually what, uh, at least from my point of view, I'm super proud because it's a super stellar release where we also uh, actually act, uh, acted up on a lot of uh, testing uh, kind of delayed release uh, also from like a marketing standpoint it gave us a lot of time to actually test it very very thoroughly also in terms of performance benchmarks so i'm actually super proud of this release because it has uh, many core cool features all right uh, let's get started chris can you just switch to the next slide so the TLDR, if you're really just here to learn about the features then you can basically drop up after the slide, I wouldn't recommend so. But um, what we have in 3.7, I would classify that into different categories. Probably the biggest one is graph performance at scale. So what we saw is that more and more people, they're actually coming to us because they are running into graph problems which require more than one node. And in 3.7, we added a number of features we'll discuss in more detail, uh, exactly addressing those needs. How can you actually uh, have a pretty good, or how can you have decent uh, graph performance across a large cluster of nodes? Um, the second biggest uh, block of features is probably the Arango search upgrades, where we added fuzzy search, so if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, if you have a typo in your phrase, um, this is still going to find it. Maybe just as a reminder, Arango search is our full text search engine, so similar to, for example, the scene elastic uh, you might be aware about. And the nice thing is this is integrated as everything in Arango DB, so you can basically leverage a full text search and then from each document being found, uh, start, use it to start a graph traversal. Um, furthermore, we added a lot about cluster scalability. Let me maybe explain a bit what I, uh, or what we mean by that. So first of all, we added a number of things for supporting larger clusters. I think that's kind of obvious from the name cluster scalability. But the most features also internally um, we did here were targeted to running a RangoDB clusters on cloud or Kubernetes infrastructures. What is different here? So if I'm running in a traditional data center, I basically have my two servers, I'm gonna keep those servers forever. And uh, maybe it's gonna be a really rare event that I'm gonna reboot or change, uh, cha change them for maintenance. But if we are in a cloud environment, especially if we are like on a Kubernetes cluster, uh, these kind of changes uh, happen way more frequently. Um, there might be a maintenance window, there might be Kubernetes saying, hey, I'm going to take down that pod for whatever reason. So we have a lot more churn in terms of like, I usually call it dynamic infrastructure. And this is where we added a number of features because first of all, we have our Kubernetes operator, but secondly, also our managed service Oasis is actually building up on top of uh, Manage Kubernetes solutions by the various cloud providers. So we actually have to support that. The next feature, which is kind of its own block of features, is probably schema validation. One advantage of document databases is that actually you don't have to specify a schema upfront. But uh, still, for many use cases, it's super useful to be able to do that. Imagine, for example, you have like some customer data and you want to make sure you have the address in there. Prior, I've seen a lot of people writing just like a small Fox microservice uh, on top, uh, doing the validation. But with schema validation, we can actually do that now inside the database. Um, next, uh, on kind of the security or uh, data center front, uh, we added uh, the rotation of JWT uh, tokens, so the admin user tokens, 
and for the TLS certificates, so kind of for uh, the communication layer encryption. And now imagine your sysadmin uh, or your DevOps in 2020 is leaving the company. You want to make sure he isn't keeping any of that. You can actually rotate all those secrets. Furthermore, we added a number of uh, metrics. So already in 3.6, we added uh, Grafana Prometheus monitoring stack. And here we now added a lot of metrics, especially around cluster distribution and cluster scalability, again, uh, targeting those dynamic infrastructures. Um, we added furthermore register planning. So uh, you might have seen that if you've been longer with the WrangleDB that in 3.6 we already added improved SAC query support, but with register planning now uh, the performance is still improved quite a bit. Of course, we register planning is kind of like how do we keep uh, sub results from uh, different parts of the query and can kind of merge them later on. Um, last, uh, for those of you who have actually multiple data center, our data center to data center replication is uh, also improved in terms of uh, yeah, small stability bug fixes, but I think the biggest one is that we uh, increased a lot the performance here. So your asynchronous uh, DC to DC replication is going to be much faster in sync, reducing that window um, where uh, you might be exposed. Uh, last, kind of like a non-feature, because we're removing things, is the deprecation of the MM file storage engines. So this is for those of you who have been really long with the RangoDB. MM files used to be the default storage engine pre 3.2, if I recall correctly. Um, but it was replaced by RocksDB. Uh, we later are going to see kind of the different uh, trade-offs why this actually makes sense. Uh, but it was already deprecated in 3.6, uh, so now we fully removed it in 3.7. The next slide, please. This has been kind of the short agenda, so if you really like, hey, this is all I want to learn, feel free to drop off. But we have actually much more on the roadmap, on the agenda here. So we'll discuss those 3.7 features in some more detail. Uh, and we'll also give a glimpse of what's coming in 3.8, which is the release we're currently working on, all of the engineering team. Um, and we'll also, for those of you who are new to ArangoDB, we'll give a short intro into ArangoDB. But before that, let's actually introduce ourselves. So I'm Jörg, I'm the head of engineering and machine learning at ArangoDB. So I kind of try to manage the product roadmap, I try to manage the engineering team. And prior to that, I've been at uh, various companies, so kind of my, my career is basically switching back and forth between ba uh, building database systems or building large scale machine learning infrastructure. So from like uh, my PhD work, which was about distributed database systems over building parts of SAP HANA over to Mesosphere, where I built a lot of machine learning infrastructure, Suki. And now here at the RangerDB, I actually have the advantage since, well, one and a half years now to actually be able to combine both those passions. Uh, with me, this is actually Chris. And Chris, if you haven't already seen or seen some of his videos, uh, I think you can introduce yourself uh, best. Hey there, yes, yeah, as I said, my name is Chris and I'm the developer relations engineer at Arango. And so that uh, involves like my day to day of uh, working on training and really learning uh, like with 3.7, uh, the very, very early builds and trying to uh, learn more about the features and, and make it so that I can provide uh, better training for people wanting to learn about them. Um, and we'll see with some of the notebooks today on that side of things. Uh, otherwise, I'm a developer by, by trade, so that's, that's my passion, and I know that it's important to be able to learn, um, learn about the things you need to learn <laughs> to be able to make your applications and your projects. So uh, I, can, I really enjoy doing, uh, creating the learning content, and, and if you guys have any ideas or feedback on any of the stuff you currently see out there, uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me either through Slack or on my Twitter or uh, through our email, um, learn at arangodb.com. Um, yeah, that's me. Cool. 
two more sentences about logistics. Feel free to ask questions in the chat at any point in time. Uh, if you're too shy or you just want to ping us directly or questions are coming after the webinar, uh, feel free to reach out via the ArangoDB community Slack. Uh, so there's both Chris and myself uh, online, just ping us and we're happy to answer all, any questions you might have. Okay, with that, let's actually dive in. Uh, for those of you who have never heard, I don't actually believe Chris, you registered for this webinar, but for those of you who are new to ArangoDB, uh, ArangoDB is actually the first native multi-model uh, database. And what do we mean by that? When we started out, there, were, there was this hype of like uh, graph databases, document databases. So were, there, were all those NoSQL databases coming out? But our co-founders, they actually uh, have been in the database consulting business for quite a while. And one challenge they had basically implementing all those different NoSQL database systems with customers were that typically one data model like a graph document isn't sufficient to cover an entire use case because it's only like one small subpart. And this is the idea of actually supporting multi-models, so multiple data models inside one database. And we'll get a short glimpse at how that looks like in just a few slides. There is an uh, open source version. This is probably what uh, most people use. Um, and for those who actually need some more enterprise support, so for example, some security features or enterprise features, there's also an enterprise version giving support uh, and uh, proper commercial license. We have been around now for over uh, eight years. So 1.0 was in 2012. So it's been quite a long ride and it's really exciting to see how far we've gotten here. We got uh, over 60 or roughly 60 employees at the moment and uh, we are scattered, especially in the development team, pretty much all over the world between US, uh, Germany, of course, uh, as we were founded here. Uh, a lot of them are still in Cologne but also in other German cities and Poland, Netherlands, so Russia, uh, pretty scattered all over. Next slide, please. Native multi-model. So as already mentioned, the idea of a RangoDB is to support multiple data models at, a, at the same time. And here is actually what I personally believe is that the combination of all of that is actually more than the sum of all its parts. Because it's not just that I use it for one data model. I, we sometimes see people taking a RangoDB to replace like a graph database, but often where I really get the value out of it is if I'm actually leveraging several data models at the same time. So for example, I can leverage a Rango search, um, look up, uh, do like a fuzzy search, look up some documents, and then from there spawn a graph traversal to find further related metadata uh, about this particular document I found. Uh, a RangoDB is a distributed database. So it's in particular, graphs can actually span multiple nodes. And this is important because uh, as we already saw, we have a number of features related to that, uh, making sure that we can still, while graphs spawning multiple nodes, have a good query performance. Uh, a RangoDB comes with its own query language. We'll talk a bit about query languages later on uh, in the 3.8 Outlook, um, which is like a SQL-like multimodal query language. And the co core idea here again is that I want one query language supporting all the different data models. So I don't want to switch from like uh, something like OpenCypher uh, for querying the graph part of my data to uh, some other language supporting the document part of my data, but I really need that all in one language because otherwise uh, I can't get these, uh, can't get like a decent query performance and I still have to uh, write uh, multiple queries at the same time. Um, there's actually just trying to shortly answer that question about uh, video courses. This is actually uh, Chris's metier. There are a lot of training courses. Maybe Chris, you can shortly uh, put the link into the uh, chat here. Uh, otherwise, uh, please switch to the next slide. So um, to just grasp that, grasp that idea of uh, multi-model databases, if we look at uh, a graph database, a graph database, we have here vertices and edges. 
and uh, we can efficiently do queries across that, like give me all the neighbors in distance two or something like that, all friends uh, which can be reached on this certain path. But um, the other kind of database would be a document database. Next slide, please. And that kind of looks like that. So typically it's like a JSON-like document uh, where it can store without a particular schema, so kind of schema less or schema free, depends on whether we want the optional one, uh, cert certain information, and this can even be nested. The idea now, the core idea of a RangoDB is actually to combine this into one. Next slide, please. And oh, one, one more. <laughs> And this means is that actually all the um, vertices can be random uh, documents. So uh, if I would just take uh, a RangoDB as a document database, it would just be documents without any edges in between. But uh, arbitrarily nested, I can do all the kind of operations I would expect from a document database. But the core uh, benefit actually comes from that I can now can simply define edges. And edges, next slide please are also simply documents. So my edge can uh, contain information. And again, this is not just a simple list of properties. This is actually can be a full-fledged document as well, uh, storing arbi arbitrary information. Um, next slide. We are really uh, proud of our community. And I think we also work pretty tight, tightly together with them. So we have over 10 million downloads. We have 550 production installations we know about. And, oh, I should have updated that number. We actually uh, recently crossed 10,000 stargazers at GitHub. And if we just look at uh, kind of the GitHub stars, the stargazers, this is increasing pretty, pretty drastically. So. Uh, this is where we actually really, I myself, I'm an open source person. I've mostly worked on open source projects during my career. And I'm really proud that we have such cool community around here. Thanks everyone uh, here who is uh, in this webinar. Next slide, please. Um, Recall 3.6. So RangoDB 3.6 is the prior version. And I just wanted to have uh, some uh, review of it because uh, it actually sets the, some of the foundations also for 3.7. So in 3.6, we actually introduced one shard scalability. So one shard is a particular use case. We have uh, one detailed slide on that where I can easily, if I have like a multi-tenant setup, scale out my cluster and making sure that every all the information, all the query processing can happen within one shard, as long as I know like this one shard, this one database will fit onto a single uh, server. Furthermore, we actually set the foundations for the, I would call it cloud native metric stack. So uh, Prometheus, Grafana, uh, you can of course also plug in your favorite tool of choice supporting uh, these protocols. And uh, this actually uh, helps us uh, quite a bit. We also are publishing more and more dashboards uh, with our default monitoring recommendations. We improved Arango Search quite a bit, but uh, we'll talk a bit more about Arango Search in the 3.7 part and added a number of performance improvements, especially subquery uh, optimization. Like subqueries, it's the same as you might know from any relational system. I can use just like a subquery uh, to identify like some larger data set and then refine that uh, by uh, leveraging like further queries. And uh, furthermore, uh, we have uh, added like more improvements to something called hot backup, which is a very fast enterprise mechanism to take backups of a random DB. Next slide, please. So one chart. So this is basically a logical database which still is replicated within a cluster. But as I know that it can be handled by a single DB server, so that database won't grow larger than uh, whatever size of nodes I have, um, I can actually um, indicate that and then all the query processing can happen on that single node. So I don't need during query processing uh, any network communication, only to replicate uh, the outcome of that query uh, throughout the cluster. So this is 
very highly supported for many graph use cases or if I have uh, like a lot of document joins because if I have to rely on network traffic there, this is gonna become slow and uh, can be, uh, it, it's just faster if I uh, can leverage, like stay on a single node. I mean, network traffic is still bound to, at least by the speed of light and in many clusters and considering the speed of today's CPUs, this is actually a pretty, pretty significant boundary uh, of speed we can uh, achieve for network communications. So uh, the advantages of OneShot are basically I get local query performance. Uh, I can still get all the asset uh, guarantees for my transactions, but it's still replicated synchronously for fault tolerance to other nodes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think we can skip over that in terms of time, but this is what I, what I mentioned earlier. We added uh, basically the foundation for, uh, for all the metric stack. Next slide, please. And yeah, now we actually reach the core of uh, our, our webinar here. And this is a RangoDB 3.7. As said, we have those different categories and I would now just step through them in uh, sequence and actually talk a bit more in detail about the individual features. Next slide, please. So let's start with disjoint smart graphs. Smart graphs is a feature which was introduced in RangoDB a while back. And it's basically a smart charting uh, strategy. If I have a large graph, which doesn't fit on a single node, uh, as it would do, for example, for, um, for if I, otherwise I could just throw it in like a one chart database, but I know that I have just very few edges uh, in between different highly clustered components of the graph. So often we have like very dense subgraphs, which are then just, uh, 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 connected by very few edges to other uh, highly connected uh, subgraph. And with smart graphs, you could basically specify that and a RangoDB would make sure that uh, we kind of scatter those subgraphs across nodes to minimize the number of uh, hops needed during graph traverses so that we don't have to jump back and forth between nodes. With disjoint smart graphs, we even go one step further. If we know that we have disjoint uh, sub partitions of our graphs, which don't have any edges in between them. This actually allows us to leverage uh, even the query optimizer further and push all the query processing down to the DB servers. So uh, in that case, if we are looking for a particular node, a neighboring another node, we can really push that down to all the different DB servers in parallel, and then the coordinator uh, just has to accumulate uh, the result and print it out but we don't have to do like any hops between different nodes, simply because we know we can answer the query uh, locally uh, on each of these subpartitions. Um, next part, next slide. This is satellite graphs. So I said uh, disjoint smart graphs, they are basically a smart uh, sharding strategy, uh, where satellite graphs, we can actually leverage another property we've seen in many customer use cases or many community use cases as well. And this is that uh, often we have a large number of uh, documents somewhere around. So for example, imagine an IoT use case, I have all my sensor readings and there are simply so many sensor readings they don't fit on a single node, so I have to shut them out. Um, but now one advantage of a RangoDB being a multi-model database is that I can have a graph with meta information. So if we are taking that IoT examples with sensors, this might be sensor location uh, or other metadata about these sensors. And typically those metadata graphs, uh, it really makes sense to have that as a graph because I can connect things, I can connect different sensors, I can have like a hierarchy, find all the sensors being based in a specific region, for example, or only three hops away from somewhere else. Um, and uh, this metadata graph often isn't too large, but uh, as it has a small size, we don't even have to shard it across a different nodes, we can simply replicate it. And this is precisely the idea of satellite graphs, where I take this small metadata graph, I replicate it, uh, I don't have to worry about it as a user, I simply mark it as a satellite graph, and then a RangoDB will make sure it gets replicated across all the nodes, and I can get uh, 
I can again uh, execute all the queries locally in parallel and then just have to combine the results on top. So as you see, a lot of those performance optimizations go into the uh, direction of reducing network traffic because network traffic is always expensive. Next slide. There are a large number of further performance optimizations. If you really want to learn all about them, I would uh, recommend to go to the change log um, where they're really described in detail. But uh, I think the kind of the coolest ones, they are actually listed here. So that's parallel uh, traversals for graph. So it's here on the right. I can basically now specify the parallelism on the outer, uh, outer traversal query. So here, this is an AQL query. Um, and now we basically say we want to start four threads in parallel uh, looking out for this particular pattern. And this is ex uh, especially useful if I want to do pattern matching across large graphs. We added a very large number of other graph and traversal improvements, uh, often reducing the amount of information we have to pull from um, the underlying storage layer. So often we can now uh, reduce the amount of data we need to get from this for graph traversals to hopefully even zero, which is not always the case, but we can severely reduce it in many use cases. Um, uh, we further improved the subquery optimizations all, and also we added a number of count optimizations. So if you're, for example, just counting the number of documents matching a particular pattern, uh, this is also going to be much faster simply because, again, we don't have to load any data from this. We just have to count the number of documents in each one that. Next slide. Arango search uh, improvements. So Arango search also uh, was pretty featured in the 3.7 development cycle uh, where we added a fuzzy search. So fuzzy search, often when you're looking for something, if you're typing a Google query and you have a typo in there, Google is actually still going to be able to find results which match probably the original word. Um, and you can do the same with a Rango search, uh, leveraging fuzzy search. So fuzzy means uh, we're not going to look for an exact match, but some fuzzy match with like one or two letters off or a similar distance measure being defined. And here's the two distance measures we support now are Levenstein uh, distance and Ngram similarity. Furthermore, we added wildcard search. So wildcard search is basically like a like uh, operator with the regex where I can specify a particular pattern I want to look for. Um, for example, uh, anything with like a specific sequence somewhere in the middle of more than three letters off to the right or some, some weird regex expression you can come up with. Uh, we added covering indices. So this means that often uh, if you have configured those indices, we can now answer queries from the index directly and don't have to touch up on the uh, RocksDB storage engine. So again, this is like a way of improving the performance for many queries. And uh, last but not least, we added uh, support for many languages uh, so now we uh, uh, support, just look in the change log, I think somewhere like, uh, so we added like for uh, roughly like 30 more languages total. Next slide. Cluster scalability. So cluster scalability uh, works on basically how can we support larger clusters with uh, a Rango DB. And the second aspect here is how can we support larger clusters on dynamic infrastructures such as Kubernetes or various cloud providers. And as outlined in the beginning, this is just a bit different from this old model where I just have stationary servers which are going to be permanently available for my database. Uh, the two biggest features uh, we added here are incremental plan update. So the plan is kind of the internal state of the cluster uh, the, we have to communicate. So each part in the cluster kind of knows what others know, where they are, uh, are they on the same data version or do they first need to get in sync, things like that. So what is kind of the internal state of the cluster 
uh, we need to know before performing any queries. With incremental plan update, we severely reduce the amount of data we need for those plan updates, simply because uh, we only send the increments and not always the full plan update, which A is uh, reducing the amount of data we need to process, the amount of data we need to ship throughout the cluster um, for, for those updates, um, and uh, also uh, just the, the overall effort needed uh, to deal with that. Next, we have parallel move chart. What is, what is actually move chart? Uh, while well, Chris is going back, so move chart is the operation. If I'm uh, moving um, data from one server to another, if I'm kind of saying, hey, this server uh, needs to be decommissioned, it needs to be put in maintenance, please move all this data over to another server. Um, so this is a move chart operation, and we now uh, really increase the performance here by uh, adding more parallel uh, processing and more parallel data transfer. So again, this is like a typical use case for those dynamic infrastructures where I'm taking servers down, I'm adding servers, and hence we have much more data transferred in between them. Next thing, this is coming in the next minor release. So currently we're actually already at 3.7.2 and uh, the next version is going to be 3.7.3. And here we add um, more scalability improvements in terms of database creation. So for users who leverage a large number of databases in the cluster, um, this might be a challenge because the amount of processing required currently because we are basically checking everything uh, currently is uh, o of number of already existing databases so the more databases you create the more expensive it's uh, getting um, and with 373 we actually gonna just make that uh, more more or less constant time so independent of the number of databases in the cluster now you can switch to the next slide Chris please Schema validation. As mentioned, um, being a document database, it's super nice to be schema free. But on the other hand, often I want to have a certain patterns being followed. And there's this nice schema language for that called JSON schema. And now we support that, that you can optionally, obviously, specify uh, a schema for your, uh, for your collection. And you can also say how severely that should be enforced. So you can either say, I only want a warning, uh, or I want to uh, just really not be able to add this um, overall. OK, um, so I think this is uh, a cool use case. So Chris, I believe, has prepared even a demo for that to just show you the ins and out of that. And uh, I just see that uh, question here uh, about which features are enterprise. On the first overview slide, and as uh, said in the beginning, we're going to share those slides also in the end. It's marked which uh, features are enterprise or not. Uh, or again, just feel free to ping any of us on the uh, community Slack. Over to Chris. There we go. All right. Thank you. Yes, and I do have a notebook pulled up. And what I will actually do um, is I'm going to go ahead and share this link as well. So if you would like to follow along, uh, this is a notebook that you can run yourself. Uh, and uh, what we have actually set up is a training environment so that it'll actually generate a deployment for you to use. It's just a temporary deployment that gets deleted after a couple hours, but uh, if you wanted to follow along or just more so probably play around uh, afterwards, uh, that's a really good way to do it and, and kind of see some immediate results. Um, okay, and I think someone's indicating they can't hear. Are you guys able to hear me? I can hear you fine, so okay. I believe uh, uh, I'll perfect. Okay. Uh, try try to switch on your uh, play with your audio audio device. Like on the lower left uh, of your screen, there should be like this 
uh, microphone symbol, just uh, click on the arrow, upwards arrow next to it and see what uh, you need to select there. Otherwise, sometimes only restarting Zoom helps, uh, but the, and obviously he can't hear us, uh, but <laughs> in, in, in worst case, the recording is going to include everything. I'm going to try to talk to it. Okay, and so uh, for this example, it would be a, a pretty simple example. The main thing we wanted to show off was the implementation for a schema validation. Uh, and as you'll see, it's, it's pretty straightforward, especially if you're already familiar with the JSON schema. Um, and this is going to seem uh, pretty intuitive. Uh, so the first thing we have here is just some setup, uh, importing some things. We're using the PyArongo driver throughout this. Um, and we just do some cleanup and then generate that temporary database, like I mentioned. Um, and then the first things first, whenever you do uh, want schema validation on your collection, uh, that's something that you can do at creation time or you can update the properties uh, with a schema. Uh, and so for this first example, I just wanted to show creating a collection and then inserting documents. Um, this sort of scenario is we have a, a database of customers uh, and initially we did not want or, or need any sort of schema for them, um, but then later we are going to add that. And so for this first one, we create a customer's collection, add two documents, one containing an email, one not. And uh, then we print out that those documents were indeed uh, added. And actually, I have the web interface up as well, so we should be able to view them. And there they are. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, this, uh, this temporary database is a full uh, ArongoDB database. So you can go play around um, with more than this, load your own data. Again, it uh, will automatically delete on its own in like a few hours. So. OK, and so that is the simple way of adding documents. We're going to go ahead and drop reload and then this is where we get to the schema validation part like i mentioned if you're already familiar with json schema then you'll be familiar with some of the properties that we need in the rule object for the schema properties um, it will take a rule a level and a message and so for our rules all we're saying for our simple example is we want a first name that's also a string a last name that's a string and an email that's a string and then we require all of those fields by placing them in the required attribute. And then we have this uh, moderate level. And so with ArongoDB, the different levels that you can supply are going to be uh, none, which is just not having it, uh, new, which means just for newer documents, a moderate, which is uh, for new documents, and then uh, as you update documents and um, the sort of the difference between moderate and strict is that with moderate um, you you can say you know we want to update documents but if the old documents so like if you add this to a pre-existing collection and the documents did not conform to the schema when you update them it's not going to require uh, that they conform to the schema whereas if you insert a new document it's required to conform and then if you ever try to update that document it will still need to conform to the schema rules and then strict is regardless of if it previously conformed or not whenever you update it it needs to conform so hopefully that's clear um, but uh, but yeah so that's once you have this object you can pass it through whenever you create the collection here so we're going to recreate our customers collection and we're passing through the schema object that we just created up there with the schema property. Okay, and then to make sure that we see that, that should show up in our collection properties, which is what we're calling here. And there it is. So this just shows that this collection now requires a schema. And so we're back to that same sort of example where we've got the two documents. And so now what we should see is we should see one, this James Cole, not be inserted because it's missing the email uh, and Claudius, our founder, uh, should get inserted. So let's give it a go. Okay, and yes, as you can see, we get one document cannot be created, there was an error, and um, then we have the one that was actually inserted. And so now if we go back to our web view here, yep, we only have just the one with the email. 
And then the last example of this that I wanted to give was just more to show that uh, you know you can you can take full advantage of the JSON schema uh, format and, and functions there. So uh, as you can see, we're still the, the same example of first last name email, um, but we've added one uh, as well as we've added some further restrictions, saying there needs to be a min and max length for the name, last name, and email. And then we can provide a little bit more context to the customer type. So Lee, customer, enterprise, or you know, what, what type of contact are we adding? Uh, and then we don't have to require them all. Just like we're doing here, we can say, you know, we still just need the first last name email. And uh, this last attribute here is saying, do we want to allow adding other properties that aren't defined here? Which of course is very useful if you have a schema, you wanna make sure that uh, all of the documents being inserted are going to be uniform and and uh, you know just to avoid that extra unnecessary data. And I run that. Let's make sure I did. Did I already delete? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can't find it. I already did that. Okay. So now we will go to the next one and actually run this or again, just doing our, our normal create document. Uh, and one thing I guess I can show you here was, okay, so we, we still have the same result because uh, this one uh, does conform, this one still does not. That means that we would still be getting the same thing in our collection. But let's say that I know that this one is uh, 15 characters long. And since we have a restriction of a max of 20, I think I'll have to do this again here. Okay, and then try again. We should get, yeah, two failed documents. And that's because the email now is exceeding our max length limit. And so if we look back in our web view, also not there. Um, and that's really the, the main thing that I wanted to kind of show off, just a, a quick example of schema validation and basically how easy it is to set up. and. Uh, uh, the main thing to remember is, is as long as you know the object type conforms to the JSON schema draft four, uh, then then you are good to go. All right. And I will uh, pass it back. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Or while you're on it, uh, and we just talked about Rango search, do you actually want to show a short demo of the fuzzy search? I believe we actually oh, yeah. have enough time left. Yes, and there we go. Okay, so this is my fuzzy search example. So I think we should be good. I tried to preload some of the data here. Um, this example is for fuzzy search and we're using our IMDB data set. Let's actually, yeah, and so we've got our different edges uh, and vertices. And if you've taken any of our previous trainings or anything like that, you have probably seen this data set before. Um, yeah, we didn't load up the graph for this example, but uh, throughout this, what we're going to be looking at is using fuzzy search to find movie titles. And uh, the really awesome part of uh, fuzzy search is, uh, you know, that nice sort of autocomplete functionality. And then, uh, you know, even more just like, um, just trying to find relevance based on what the user, you know, if there's uh, misspellings, or you know, type those things, uh, and you still want to be able to provide relevant results. Uh, and especially if, if you don't even really know what you're looking for, you know, having some sort of context in your results uh, is really, really beneficial. Uh, and uh, some of these new uh, fuzzy search and Arango search improvements that came with 3.7 were a lot of fun to play around with. And uh, I can definitely tell you there is more to come uh, with these just because uh, this this uh, functionality functionality opens up a lot of options for us. Um, okay, and so all of this that you're looking at here is just that same setup again. We generated a, a different database here, um, and then I imported that data set, and then I also created an Orango search view, uh, which if you are not familiar with views, it is the uh, I probably won't go into too much detail on that side of it, but Orango search views are sort of the uh, index, oh, that's what I was, there we go. Okay, sort of the index in a way to uh, the data that you have stored um, for use with Arango search and Arango search specific functions. 
Um, there we, we've got some really good, actually that Udemy course that I linked has a full Orongo search section in it. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the concepts of Orongo search, I really uh, suggest maybe starting there. And then we've got a lot of awesome content on our website as well. Um, okay, and I think I have run all of this. And then I followed that up with the uh, creating an analyzer. Uh, and an analyzer is we, when we basically, in a sense, are indexing our text to data, we want to index it in a specific way. And so we're using an ingram analyzer, which uh, is the process of just basically breaking up words into their two letter forms. Um, I actually think I show off an example of this in this one. Yeah, down here um, with this example being quick fox and quick fox with an extra X. And then when we use them as an ingram, you can see how they're broken up into two, two letters and, and used for matching. And this is just a part of the process that happens when analyzing uh, search terms versus store terms um, to, to try and just help find similarity between them. I don't want to get too ahead of myself there though. Okay. Okay, so just to make sure that everything is set up correctly, I will go ahead and run this. Uh, this is a pretty just um, typical AQL query, which is we're just looking for movie types with a genre of comedy and with a specific runtime. So I just kind of want to watch a short comedy before I go about my day. And then that's what we get. So we, we are able to just define some. And, and there's nothing uh, super uh, special Orango search wise about that. It's just that that is actually accessing the view that I created above and has our IMDb movies linked to it. Okay, and the first one we'll look at is Ingram similarity. And uh, this is, all the ones that we're gonna look at are sort of our part of our fuzzy search toolkit. Um, the first ones we look at are specifically more um, for use on strings and don't require, um, uh, don't require any sort of Orongo search specific uh, setup like we were doing there. Um, and so the similarity that we're going to find here is going to give us a score. Um, and let's go ahead and run this. And so this is what this is telling us is the closer to one that this Ingram similarity returns um, tells us that you know is, is closer to, to how same how similar they are. So getting a score of 0.88 out of one total then is a pretty decent score, we can say that there, our search term is pretty similar to what we have stored in that scenario. Um, and so this is, we'll, we'll start getting at, a look, looking at some of the other ones here, um, but I guess the main takeaway is to understand that the Ingram similarity is used to, to measure differences. And um, it's just one way of analyzing uh, text to try and, and find matches. Um, and uh, actually, I haven't shared this book. I will go ahead and share this one as well, because there's going to be a lot uh, in here, probably more than I think we can cover it right now. So I'm trying not to speed through, but uh, that's another really good one to have a look at. Um, and I've put in a lot more explanation there as well. So, um, but I'm still happy to have, answer questions once we get done here also. Uh, okay. And so, See, let's go ahead and run here. Uh, this one, the I think the main thing that we wanted to look at would be the comparison between the two, and and um, the the main difference is even though the scores do look the same here, is that they're comparing partial matches versus um, complete matches. So, meaning, uh, does there need to be any sort of transformation done in order to make them match? Um, it's a, a small difference here, but depending on the level of accuracy that you're looking for, um, this can be a pretty, pretty important difference to have. So if you're wanting to use Ingram position, positional similarity, um, the, you're looking for the exact position to also be counted when doing the comparison. Okay. 
Oh, sorry. Okay, just to answer uh, that question, I guess I just saw, I think there's some other ones coming through here. Uh, is case insensitive plan? Uh, so to answer the question one, because I think the other one got answered, uh, or the uh, schema one, uh, it is you can supply if it's uh, done on insert or on update. Um, and with the moderate level, that will do updating if the inserted document previously met it. Whereas with the strict level, any document that's updated, whether or not it previously conformed or not, uh, does need to conform to the schema. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, so now to ones I think that will kind of uh, make a bit more sense just uh, having a quick look at is going to be Ingram Match. Um, this one, we're actually able to use the search term and we can provide a threshold amount and we're using, uh, I guess to point out as well, we're using our ingram or our bigram, so bigram meaning the, that we're splitting the words up into two characters. Uh, and so this is a, an example that we have for doing a search term where we understand what the movie is about, but have extremely fudgy fingers and uh, ended up typing Roto same go to Mordor. Uh, and I really like that one because it does get us the, the results we're looking for. And uh, the, the way that it's able to do that is by doing what, what I showed above, where it's splitting the things into two characters and then doing this comparison. And, and then it provides, furthermore, it provides a score, which I have actually printed out here. And so this is our similarity score. And this one is just, there's not, um, it's not like it's going to one or anything. This is just how similar uh, does, is it based on uh, we're using the BM25 uh, ranking here. Um, and so the reason that these show up is if we look in our description here, we have uh, uh, Frodo and Sam bring the ring closer to the heart of Mordor. And so with our Roto same go to Mordor, it's able to analyze this entire description and find some of the context. And, and it's able to do that because we said, okay, you don't need to be exact. You can be, you know, 0.6. We can, we can use some of our fuzziness here to get uh, still relevant results um, within a certain amount. The lower you go on this number, the less uh, relevant uh, your results are going to be. And uh, the, I, oh. I, I would probably uh, go with Levenstein then for a, an exercise for everyone with a notebook, because otherwise we unfortunately gonna run out of time. Yeah, okay, that's what I was worried about. I, so I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt <laughs> you, but yeah. No, sorry, yes, uh, and yeah, apologies again if I, I know I was kind of rushing through, I wanted to try and show up as many of those as I could. Uh, definitely, definitely reach out to me. Give that notebook a go as well. Uh, that I've, I've uh, given a much better explanation on all the different ones uh, there as well. Cool. Thanks so much for notebook and demo, Chris. Uh, can you switch back to the slides? Cool. Thanks. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, kind of other features, Chris. Now we only got seven minutes left. Um, uh, in 3.7 out of the security uh, sensitive key material rotations we talked about. Um, and I believe we actually talked about all those features already on the first slide. So please switch to the next slide. MM file deprecation. So those of you who have been with ArrangoDB for really a long time, you still might know MM files. So MM files was deprecated in 3.6 already. And now with 3.7, it's actually being removed. So uh, it has been, the RocksDB has been the default storage engine since 3.4. Um, so I don't believe it's uh, gonna hit many people, but if you're still running on 3.6 with MM files, which was possible, but you got like a lot of warning messages in your log, uh, you cannot upgrade to 3.7 without prior to that switching the, uh, to RocksDB storage engine. Overall, we would recommend to actually use RocksDB uh, anyhow, 
because it ha has a lot of advantages. First of all, in terms of like data size being supported, in terms of indices being recreated and supported, and also just in terms of like restarting uh, any node. So uh, this is uh, much faster. And I guess the biggest advantage is actually the locking behavior. Uh, whereas in MM files, we had a collection level locks. Uh, whereas in RockCB, this is actually on a document level. There is, there were some people actually relying on the collection level logs because this is kind of a change in semantic. Uh, so collection level logs, they basically serialize all the writes to a collection. If you're relying on this behavior, reach out. We kind of have a, a hacky workaround, but in my opinion, it's, it's a dangerous pattern to rely on anyhow but just reach out if this uh, is kind of an issue for you to upgrade. Uh, there's also a blog post link down here, which also shares more details uh, for exactly that and also uh, discusses the, the upgrade pass. Uh, next slide. So you can actually try 3.7 with no download or setup uh, on OrangoDB Oasis. I just wanted to spend like a few sentences on what OrangoDB Oasis is because it's actually also pretty new. Uh, next slide. So OrangoDB Oasis, it's our managed service. So it's the simplest way to run OrangoDB uh, with just a, I counted, I think it's four clicks uh, after login, you can spin up your own fully managed cluster. Uh, either a one shard or sharded deployment where there was a question earlier where you can specify the number of shards and it already has monitoring and backup policies in place so you can easily uh, have like a fully production grade cluster. Uh, it runs on the three major cloud providers, Amazon, Google and Azure with uh, I said just a few clicks and there is this free to try period where you can test it for 14 days, if I recall correctly. Um, and uh, so this would be a super easy way to actually test out uh, a Wrangler DB. Next slide, and I think you can even skip over that one. This, these are basically all the regions we supported. So if you're curious about that, just get the slides later on. Uh, but I just wanted to save the last few minutes to actually talk about the roadmap. So as mentioned, we currently are wor already working on 3.8, so the next version, and I'll share some more details on the next slide. But we are also working already on the planning and some features already for the 4.0, so the next big release uh, where we can introduce a lot, a lot of features. Um, so if you have any wishes or opinions about that, please reach out and let us know either in the chat or via preferably the community Slack, you can also just email any of us, uh, what are the features you actually would need from a Wrangler DB. Uh, next slide. So the 3.8 preliminary roadmap, there's gonna be one surprise uh, which uh, we're currently working on and hence we don't fully want to share that yet because it's a very early stage, but I can uh, promise you this is gonna be very nice and uh, it's gonna leverage uh, makes the lives of a lot of people easier uh, using a Wrangler DB. Um, furthermore, we are introducing as an experimental feature, uh, custom Pregel support. So Pregel, it's this large scale distributed graph processing framework originally proposed by Google. And we have supported Pregel actually for quite a while. The challenge was that uh, you basically had to write C++ code. And with 3.8, uh, or already our nightly, so you can actually already go in and try that out if you want. Uh, you can create your own Pregel algorithms um, on the fly for running cluster. So no C++, it's an own dialect to create that. And so we are actually expecting also a large number of uh, community defined uh, libraries here supporting many different algorithms. Next thing we are looking at, and this is going into the direction of Korean language, is GQL uh, support. So that depends a little bit how the standardization process is going, because GQL is a graph query language. It's a new standard for graph uh, queries coming up, and um, we are a part of the uh, discussion, uh, the community driving the standard. And let me just tell you, it's a 
I would say it's a more political than technical discussion. And depending on how long it takes, it might either be 3.8 or 3.9. Let's see about that. But I think this is also pretty exciting because then we'll have like one graph query language you can leverage across the entire community, across a RangoDB, across your other favorite graph databases, uh, which hopefully is a RangoDB, but your second favorite then obviously. Um, and uh, with that, you can just uh, leverage your queries. Obviously, GQL will only support uh, the graph parts of a RangoDB, and unfortunately, as it's a graph tree language, not the other parts. Uh, we are working more on topology and zone awareness. So if you're in, uh, again, a cloud cluster, Kubernetes, or something similar, you often have different fault domains. So this might be a rack, this might be a, um, an availability zone, this might be a uh, I wouldn't go uh, across regions, but if you look at the typical cloud provider setup, they actually have different levels of fault domains, which are then more unlikely to fail together because they're further apart. But on the other hand, also the latency in between them typically increases. So uh, this is something where typically you want to have a trade-off between, I want my data as close as possible for performance reason, but still I want it as far apart as possible for failover reasons. Um, we are supporting something called K-Pass graph queries. Um, and K-Pass queries are basically give me all the uh, vertices within like a radius of three. So everything exactly in a three range, uh, three distance radius. And uh, this is going to be much faster than doing a generic uh, graph traversal. Uh, to find those. And uh, we are still improving quite a bit on the debugging, query tracing. So we are in a distributed system. So typically it's hard to figure out how a query is being processed across different nodes. And here we are exposing much more information where currently our engineers are knowing like the secret hacks around that, but uh, we are putting that actually into like a nice API to make it simpler for everyone to use. So this is kind of the short outlook onto 3.8. As mentioned earlier, feel free to share uh, your opinions, feel free to share your wishes here, uh, or also for uh, later on versions. Um, with that, I would actually, if you could switch to the last slide, please. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining this webinar. And feel free to ping us with any questions. Uh, there's also a link to our training center. Uh, and this, Chris is gonna put that in the chat, I suppose, yes. And uh, also above here, they, if you uh, want to leverage it as easily as possible, just take it uh, on a test drive on Oasis. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks everyone.